Boss and the mini boss. I told him we paid big bucks. <laughs> big bu they paid big bucks oh, for this sure. tour. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Enough to his brother and my wife are still down there. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Well, let me. While we're here, I'll tell you exactly what the space is and everything. First of all, my name's Rich. I'm going to be with you as we go through three spaces up here. Cool. But this space is called Primary Flight Control. They even calls it Pry Fly. Pry Fly for short. And it's the air traffic control tower for the floating airport here. Mm -hmm. So if you look out the windows here, obviously you get a great view of the flight deck. Yeah. Basically how flight operations work, we launch aircraft from the front of the carrier. So look, we have a plane with an NF on the tail. Right. That plane's located at one of our two catapults. That's exactly where we would launch an aircraft from. So from exactly where it is, that plane would go to full power, steam-driven catapult would fire and pull the plane forward to the front of the ship. From where it is to the front of the ship is only 249 feet. In that short distance, it would go from a speed of zero to 160 miles an hour, only 249 feet. Normally at a regular commercial airport, it would take at least 2,500 feet to take off. So we're taking off in a tenth that distance. Now after we've launched a number of aircraft, we obviously have to land to recover them. When it's time to land them, one by one, then fly down the length of the ship, turn about a mile behind the ship, and then line up with that center line, which is the white and yellow painted striped line in the center of the flight deck. <clears throat> now there's another plane with the NF on the tail. That plane has simulated just coming in for a landing. The plane would have come in at about 140 miles an hour, would have had a big hook extended down from the rear of the plane called a tail hook. The carrier itself would have three wires stretching across the deck. They're called arresting wires. They're separated by about 80 feet between the first wire and the third wire. 80 feet is roughly the size of a tennis court. So you can imagine a big jet like that, precisely landing that small distance, does it correctly, the tail hook would have grabbed one of those three wires, the wires would have stretched out about 340 feet and pulled it to a stop, about where this big green helicopter is with the 46 on it. Now, if it happens to miss one of those three wires, because remember the, remember the ship itself is going up and down with the waves in the ocean, the plane then immediately goes to full power, takes off again, circles around again, and tries again for a landing. Now, the space we're in here is the home of the air boss who sits here, assisted by the mini air boss. Both of these guys are senior naval officers, Navy commanders by rank, aviators, and naval flight officers. It's pretty much a two year assignment up here, where the first year, the mini air boss, is an apprentice position, so learning the ropes, responsibilities. Second year, he gets promoted to become the air boss. The air boss gets a different assignment. They're both responsible for the effective and safe aircraft operations aboard the carrier, including all planes down the hangar deck. That's where you entered aboard the ship. Planes maneuvering up here in the flight deck. Planes flying within about five miles of the ship. And they also oversee the 250 or so sailors who actually work on the flight deck. They're those guys in those different colored jerseys. You might have seen some mannequins on the flight deck right below the island here describing the different jobs they have. Flight operations are extremely stressful and demanding. Typically 12 to six, 12, excuse me, typically 12 to 16 hours a day of flight operations. And whenever there's flight operations, these two guys are always here. They're also assisted by about eight other folks in the space on a four hour rotating watch basis. There's one enlisted guy who remotely controls the Fresnel lens. It's located across the flight deck, just to the right of that white helicopter, points backwards, and it's a visual glide slope indicator helping pilots land in that 80 foot space between the three wires. Second enlisted guy pretty much stands where I am, looks backwards, identifies the next plane coming in for landing. He then communicates below deck where they set the <coughs> resistance on those wires via hydraulics. Light plane, less resistance. Heavy plane, more resistance. Third enlisted guy maintains a status board here. It actually would swing around and attach up here where my hand is. And that guy's standing behind that board maintaining information 
such as the type of plane flying, tail number of the plane, pilot's name, his mission, etc. Again, he's standing behind that glass board and he's writing backwards on that glass board. Hmm. He's writing backwards so the air boss here and many air boss can just turn the head and read the information. I guess the Navy decided it's a lot easier to teach a few enlisted guys how to write backwards than to teach senior officers how to read backwards. <laughs> Then lastly, there's five or six junior officers standing by those uh, standing desks here with the plexiglass things. And you lift them up, under it is safety material, reference material for the type of aircraft currently flying. It's sort of equivalent to your maintenance manual in your car. So if there's any kind of issue or emergency, they can identify the problem, communicate to the pilots, and get these guys safely back on board the carrier. <coughs> in the vernacular, they're called tower flowers. They're called tower flowers because we're up in the air traffic control tower, and flowers are supposed to be seen but not heard, only when the air boss Ask for assistance so they actually hmm. talk and communicate to the pilots. <coughs> so, anyway, that's a quick overview of primary flight control. If you want more detail how planes take off and landing, there's doses like me who are retired pilots who give talks of what we're playing at so the plane with the NF there, how planes take off, and back there, how planes land. Yeah. So, I strongly encourage you to do that if you're interested in more. You got one and a half of those in already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next space we're going to go into is called the chart house. That's where we navigate the ship. <coughs> plane, so. Okay. We'll go down one flight of stairs, so follow me. <coughs> Bye. 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 About 85 feet down the water. That sound that far. Uh, yeah, get an Olympic medal, gold medal if you survive. When you get down to the parking lot, look up here. You see this big 41 up here in lights here. You see how high up, up there. Oh wow. Good, good reference point. Yeah. Yeah, that is. Going down, you can either go frontwards or backwards, you know, whatever you're more comfortable with. Okay. Make sure you hold the rails going down. Okay. I'm probably going to have to go backwards. I'm actually a Navy civilian. I worked for the Navy my whole career. I installed a whole bunch of equipment on board the carrier. This okay. ship and a whole bunch of other ship. But I was not physically in the Navy. Work for a yeah, Navy so organization good. here in San Diego. But it did give them an accuracy of about 30 meters, and they used it extensively and enjoyed using it. Uh, and uh, it gave them pretty good accuracy. So the other method that they had beyond that was the Omega system, which is a land based system that gave them an area of probability. All right, we're going to head up the chart up after the navigational bridge. See what the captain and the gator do, does up there with the bridge team and how they navigate the ship, if you will. Okay. Hey, 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 Dad, they're going to start. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to start, Dad. <laughs> hey, boss. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. No problem. Okay. There's only three of us, so I can <laughs> take it easy here. How's that on the, the deck? Waving mm. to your family down there? Exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay, this space we're in here is called the Chart House. This is the home of the navigator of the ship. The navigator himself is also a Navy commander, similar background to the air boss and mini air boss where we just came from. Now he works with a number of enlisted personnel with specialty in navigation. They're called quartermasters. So together they have sort of like three primary responsibilities. Number one, most importantly, knowing exactly where the ship is on at any instant of time. 
second of all, planning future movement, movements of the ship, pretty much how you get from point A to point B at a certain date or time in order to rendezvous with another ship for fuel or supplies or go to an operating area. Thirdly, keeping historical records where the ship has been. So it's past, present, and future. Now I mentioned again the space we're in here is called the chart house. It's called the chart house for obvious reasons. The Navy uses nautical charts for navigating. They look like maps, but they have both land and sea on there. And there are three charts on display here. <clears throat> One in this far end here is Tokyo Bay in Japan. Yokosuka, just south of Tokyo, was the last home port of Midway from 1973 to 1991. Midway was actually the first U.S. carrier that was permanently stationed overseas. <coughs> the chart here in the middle is Subic Bay in the Philippines, which was a frequent repair and resupply port of call for the Midway. Then lastly over here is uh, where we are today here in San Diego. And there's a little you're here sign right here. This is where we are physically, in case you're not familiar with the geography and layout. San Diego Harbor. <clears throat> now the Navy uses different techniques for navigating depending if you're far out at sea or close to land. When you're close to land going <coughs> in or out of port, the technique is known as piloting. It's a very visual based methodology. So if you look at any of these charts, identify <coughs> landmarks such as an island or a peninsula or even a man-made object such as a lighthouse or bridge, they're marked in those charts. So for example, the bridge here, if you look out the window there, you see that bridge over there? That's the Coronado Bay Bridge, and it's marked right here on the chart here. So anyway, you have uh, two or more watch standards <coughs> going outside here with very accurate angle measurement devices, and they simultaneously get the angle or bearing to those fixed positions. When you plot those on those charts, become straight lines. When the straight lines intersect, that's exactly where the ship was. It's called a visual fix. Now, in nighttime or in bad weather, such as when you have fog, you can augment that with radar information. Now, radar isn't very accurate for angles, but it is very precise on distances, and if you plot a fixed distance from a given point, that becomes an arc on those charts. And if you look pretty carefully, you can identify two or more arcs intersecting, that'd be called a radar fix. So the visual fixes and the radar fixes pretty much how you navigate going in or out of port. Now, when you're not close to land, you obviously have to use other techniques because you don't have any of those visual reference points. And Midway was operational for a total of 47 years, from 1945 to 1992, and technology changed big time during that period of time. In the last, oh, 20 to 25 years of its life, electronic navigation was heavily used. But in the late 1940s, 50s, even in the 60s, we used other techniques such as celestial navigation. Now there's two key measurements needed in celestial navigation. One's very accurate measurements of time with a device called a chronometer as well as with stopwatches. And secondly, it's the actual measurement, the angle to the stars, which is done with a device called a sextant. If you look in that middle case here, that black object, that's a real sextant there. <laughs> Right, you know, and, and if you want on the far side, you can get a, a sketch of one on the far side. Now, the quartermaster would typically use a technique called shooting the stars, which can be done accurately only twice a day. And the reason only twice a day is because you have to simultaneously see the horizon and see the stars, and you only can do that maybe 30 minutes or so before sunrise or after sunset. So, at those times of day, the quartermaster would go outside here, have a device called a star finder that roughly tells you what stars are visible in that part of the world you're in use the sextant to get the exact angle to the stars, you get the exact, exact time the measurements were taken, then you can convert all that information with this reference material we have right behind you here into what's called a line of position. If you do that process several times with multiple different stars, you get multiple lines of position, and somebody pretty skilled in celestial navigation could get accuracies at sea within about two or three miles, which was pretty good. Now, as I mentioned, in the last 20 or 25 years of its life, electronic navigation was much more heavily used. We had systems such as Loran, Omega, transit satellites, and finally the global positioning satellites, or GPS, that we all have in our cell phones today. But if you look in that box right there, right under the fan there, that's a device that takes inputs from all those signals. You press a button, tells you exactly where you are from a latitude and longitude perspective. It's sort of equivalent to a Garmin device you may have in your car today, which today is, you know, probably like four or five inches by one inch and annoyingly talks to you all the time. <laughs> That's the kind of technology we had in the 1980s. Then lastly, behind me here, this big gray box is a device called a fathometer. That uses sound waves to measure the depth of the water wherever you are. Now the keel or the bottom of the midway when it was operational was like 35 feet below the water line. So you always wanted to have some margin of error. Let's say you want at least 40 or 42 feet of minimum water depth. To know what the water depth is wherever you are, again, look at the charts. So if you look at the charts in the white area, which is the ocean, you see a whole bunch of little black numbers. That's actually the depth of the water in that part of the world. Now, the scale of this chart happened to be in meters. So 42 feet equates to roughly about 14 meters of water depth. So that's the minimum amount you'd ever want. The Navy really frowns big time on any ship running aground, especially an aircraft carrier, and that'd be a really bad day 
or the navigator of the ship as well as the captain of the ship and would pretty much end the careers if that ever happened. And that actually has happened. Ships have run aground and that's pretty much the end of the career of those kind of captains. And the navigator as well. So we're going to go forward to the bridge in a second unless you guys have any questions at all. I can... Want to, want to guess what's in the safe over here? I always like asking that question. I'm guessing it's not money. Well, it could be money, could be lunch, Ransom. breakfast. <laughs> it was actually a place where they had classified messages that came up here about where the ship needed to be and when they weren't using them, they would lock them up. Actually, when we have this thing, condition called general quarters, when close to a wartime, all these doors would be closed and nobody would be able to come up. So they used these, they're called bunny tubes. You probably remember way back in the... Uh, before we had ATMs and banks and everything, you'd drive a drive-up teller and you'd put your uh, deposit slip and money in a little chute that shoots into the, the belt and very similar kind of technology. And a little uh, tube comes up with a message inside so they could get messages up to close out places when it was in, close to a battle condition. Hmm. But anyway, so they would store messages, classified messages up here when they weren't really in use. But we docents like to think Navigator has a special bottle of scotch in there. <laughs> and unfortunately now we've lost the combination. Uh, so uh, you guys, you know, safe crackers at all? Uh, yeah. you know? No. <laughs> I got a, a question for you though. All sure. throughout the ship you have all these wires. Yep. And they look like they've all been painted a dozen times. <laughs> You're right. Mm -hmm. so, and you wonder why would they paint them the same color? Well, I'm just wondering, you know, in a regular home you might have to redo your floor. Yes. The wiring, wiring, would, wiring would break and they would typically just run another wire. It's too hard to so diagnose. So you had a, you had a, a maintenance crew. Right, obviously. maintenance crew, you're right. For the whole, every aspect. Every aspect of the ship, and they'd run these things through all through the different spaces. And again, no no rhyme or reason. Maybe Stan here can tell you why they're painted blue here. You go another space to paint it green. Paint. As a matter of fact, they had just blue paint at the time. They had, they had, had a <laughs> sail on blue paint. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in other places, exactly. they had a sail on green paint. Yeah. And blue stands for men, and then pink is for girls. Oh, I see. Right yeah. We don't have any pink faces. <laughs> we don't have any pink faces. <laughs> Come on, guys. Let's go. I got 21 in my group if you want to. I don't need the mic. Well, I'll take it off. I think group of three. Oh, okay, yeah, what are you about three people around the perimeter of this table? Thank right. you. Down, yeah. Thank you. Where we're walking here is called Vultures Row. It's called Vultures Row because people I'd sit on stand up here and watch flight operations. And it looks like from down below it looks like a bunch of vultures sitting on trees overseeing it's called Vultures Row. Were they were they enlisted or are they just well, it could be officers or whatever if you you, you had to be get some permission to come up here. Oh, I see. And th when I mentioned some of those precise measurements for angles, this is a device they would use. Very precise telescoping at an angle so you could get angles and bearings to fix position. Okay, come on in. Okay, who wants to be the captain of the three of you? Got to sit in this chair right here if you're the captain. All right. All right. There you go. All right. He looks like a good captain here. So this is the bridge. The chair, the chair on the far side, that says gator. The picture of an alligator. That's not really for an alligator. It's actually a nickname for the navigator when he's not up in the uh -huh. chart house. Gotcha. He'd be sitting up here helping the overall navigation of the ship. So anyway, this is the overall bridge. This is the main control center, command center of the overall ship. Um, this is where the captain would be. He'd be sitting in the chair with this gentleman sitting right there. Um, if you lean forward a little bit, you, in the back of the chair it says CO, stands for Commanding Officer. Commanding Officer is a full Navy captain by rank, what's called a four striper or 06 in military terms. He'd be about 47 years old or so, have about 25 years of operational experience. Typical assignment of the, of the captain of the Midway was an 18 month assignment. If he did a good job, there's a reasonable chance he'd get promoted to Admiral after this assignment. He has the ultimate authority and responsibility of everything on board the ship, the overall mission of the ship, the equipment of the ship, and the 4,500 sailors on board all ultimately report to the captain. But when he's sitting in that chair, he's more in a monitoring and overseeing kind of role. He would delegate the minute-by-minute -minute operation to several junior officers. One would pretty much be where I'm standing. I'd be called the officer of the deck. I've been trained and certified by the captain to carry out his orders on his behalf during my four-hour watch. I have the ability to communicate to other ships, shore sites, aircraft with these secure red phones above me here. I have intercom systems here to be able to talk anywhere on board the ship and various instruments and dialed behind me for carrying out my responsibilities. 
I'm assisted by a junior officer deck as well, who typically double hats. That's what's called the conning officer or control officer. Now, whoever has the con is the only one authorized to give orders to people in the secondary room called the pilot house as to the course and speed the ship should be on. So if any one of you want to go behind this big gray console where you see that green and red ball, it is a steering wheel. That's exactly where the ship is steered from. The person manning that is called the helmsman. Conning officer give orders to the helmsman to steer a certain course. This compass is up here and over there. They carry out that order. Right over here, this is where the speed is controlled. The person manning that is called the lee helmsman. The conning officer might give the order, all engines ahead full. If he gave that order, you would turn these knobs directly to them to all ahead full. When he did that, it would get replicated automatically way down below deck in the engine room, and then down in the engine room, it would add more steam from the engine through the